Okay. Okay, I'm Roy Peter Rakowski. I'm the Vice President of Product Management for SkyTide. We are the, the leader in digital media performance management. We provide reporting and analytics software for leading telcos, content delivery network operators, and media companies actually in nine different countries and five continents around the world right now. Our customers include leaders like MTV Networks, British Telecom, you name it, a lot of leaders in their space. We're really excited right now because we just announced our partnership with Broadpeak. Broadpeak's a really cool company. They're a spin out from Thomson Technicolor in France. So they're based in Brittany, which is actually a hot spot of uh, IP video activity. And they provide a video content delivery platform that uh, companies that are s want to start video content delivery networks can use to really get a head start on it. And that platform is now including our reporting and analytics capability. Uh, we, we are especially excited also because we think that this really rides a trend that you're seeing right now, and it's even bubbling up to the headlines in the mainstream press that the general public is seeing. So I'm sure you've seen the headlines lately about how at peak times, people watching movies on Netflix occupy 20% of the bandwidth of the internet in the US. And you've probably also seen headlines about this feud going on between Comcast and Level 3, which is all about the impact of that kind of video traffic on the internet service provider community. This is Comcast in their ISP hat talking there. It's not them as a cable pay TV operator. Uh, the uh, trends, uh, again, I'm sure it's no news to you that video traffic on the internet is growing at something like a 60% CAGR every year, and soon it'll be 90% of the traffic on the internet. And that's just a lot of traffic getting dumped on the ISPs of the world, and it's generally uncompensated traffic. And that in itself should be enough to tell you that it's a pretty major problem for them. But actually, I think if you look at the historical context around the situations of the companies that are ISPs, and you know, in any given neighborhood, the ISPs of note tend to be the telephone company and the cable company, right? If you look at the history of those industries, uh, you really see what a huge existential crisis this may even turn out to be. So if you go back to Alexander Graham Bell, right? The telephone company started out, they hooked their line up to your home or place of business, and they had you locked in because the telephone was a necessity, and they're a monopoly. Depending on what country you're in, is either a government monopoly or a regulated monopoly. And that was great, because they had you locked in. And as long as they had you in that relationship, they could upsell you to more and better things, long distance plans, voicemail, call waiting, then the internet. And at some point, you know, this other line got hooked up to your house, and that was the cable line. And that was no big deal to the telcos, because the cable line was just for video entertainment. And not in a million years did the telcos think they were ever going to have anything to do with video entertainment, right? That, however, was before deregulation, competitive access, cable companies offering the triple play, which included the internet and voice telephone service. It was before people getting mobiles and thinking they didn't need a landline anymore. So obviously, the core revenue source of telcos was under attack. It's actually very interesting, Larry. You hear the term cord cutting thrown around a lot lately. But it's generally used in relation to cable companies. And it can't be taken literally, because it usually talks about people who are going to stop paying the pay TV subscription. But they would still keep the cable line, typically, as their ISP in order to bring in the over-the-top video services that allow them to no longer want their pay TV service. So it's not literally cutting the cord. But if you look at the situations that the telcos are facing, you could take the term cord cutting quite literally, because a lot of people just have no need for the telephone company anymore. And they can completely sever that relationship. And once the telco loses that customer relationship, they lose their ability to upsell you and more and more services, that's their whole growth model completely out the window. So it's interesting that one of the things that some telcos will do to try and regain some revenue growth is to offer an IPTV service over their network. So it's kind of interesting that originally the cable company was sort of the nemesis of the phone company. Now the uh, phone company can fight back 
And now the cable company finds its historical revenue source under fire in, from two directions. One is the IPTV service, but moreover, again, those over-the-top over video services that lead to what is typically referred to as cord cutting. So now, in many ways, the telcos and the MSOs or cable companies are in the same boat with, number one, their traditional revenue sources under fire, and number two, this onslaught of uncompensated traffic hitting them, thanks largely to the OTT services. And what you have there is a cost revenue squeeze. You know, that is why I call it an existential crisis, because being caught in one of those squeezes is just no fun at all. So what can they do about it? Well, you've got this uncompensated traffic. There's two th things that quickly come to mind. One is find a way to make it compensated. Another is to reduce the impact of it as a cost driver. So let's talk about the second one first. One thing that a lot of network operators have figured out they can do is something that's variously referred to as transparent proxy, reverse caching, reverse proxy, whatever permutations of those words you want. To keep an explanation of that very simple, that's basically a CDN that the content owner not only doesn't have to pay for, but doesn't even know it's there. Basically, the ISPs will use caching as a way to deduplicate the traffic traversing their net network. So for example, if 10,000 people who are customers of ISPX want to watch a certain movie on Netflix, instead of having 20,000 replications of that movie crossing from one end of that ISP network to the other, probably originating at a commercial CDN cache, you know, a node of Akamai or Limelight, instead of having 20,000 of those traverse the ISP network, how about just having one of them traverse the first time somebody watches it, and then caching it at the near end of the ISP network. So all future 19,999 bottles of beer or whatever get uh, satisfied from that node. Now, that's basically how transparent proxy caching works. It's a great way for the ISPs to reduce their network costs. You know, network capacity, it used to be cheap back when people had overbuilt during the last boom and they ended up with a lot of dark fiber. But once you get 66% compound annual growth rate video coming at you, soon that dark fiber lights up. And now having to lay new cable, dig holes in streets and everything to make more capacity, that's very expensive. You don't want to do it. It's much cheaper to deduplicate the traffic, avoid digging up the street, and just buy a few servers to cache with. Now, once that starts to happen, you might see some interesting, unforeseen second order effects. So those 19,999 uh, views of that movie that are now uh, satisfied from the ISP's own cache aren't hitting the Akamai cache anymore. Which means, uh, depending on, if you're a content owner, depending on your contract structure with the Akamai or Limelights of the world, you either are paying a whole lot of money for a whole lot of nothing, or you may just not be paying. So this could really create some interesting disruptions to the CDN business if it becomes very widespread. And you know, when you're the ISP and you're now caching content for the Netflix or YouTubes or whoever of the world, you might think, well, they used to pay Akamai for this. Why don't I collect some money for that? And maybe if you're a content owner that doesn't want to pay them, they stop uh, providing you with that caching, which you know, not only does it save the ISP some network money, but it also actually tends to improve quality. You know, if the ISPs decide to get into the CDN business, they have a couple of key advantages over the incumbents in the space. One is a cost advantage because they own the underlying network. The Akamai's and Limelight's of the world don't own the underlying network. They need to lease their bandwidth from network owners, and they tack their own margin on this. And I think, Larry, one time we talked before, I used the word disintermediation. This is classic disintermediation. This is cutting out the middleman, network owner providing the CDN services themselves. And then something I hinted at before is a quality advantage. Something, uh, another thing that we've spoken about before, Larry, is the relationship between quality and video resolution and viewer engagement on the internet. And you know, when the kind of video viewing we're talking about, 
is just some guy taking a three minute break from their job in the afternoon to watch something on YouTube for a few minutes. Uh, there really is not that strong a relation between the quality of the video and how long they watch for. But it's a different story when you want your online video to take the place of conventional TV, cable TV, satellite TV. If the competition is in high definition, then you've got to be something like HT, HD yourself. You've got to be something like HD yourself. And in order to be HD, you actually want to minimize the length of public internet that the video signal traverses. Because remember, the internet was not designed to carry video. The internet is the old ARPANET. It's a packet switching network. It was actually designed to carry text messages in time of nuclear war. It's putting video out over the internet as it is architected today is really shoving a square peg in a round hole. So there are significant advantages to, as I said, minimizing the amount of internet that a signal traverses, which means you want to cache it and deliver it from a node as close to the user as possible. And general CDNs are never going to get their caching and streaming nodes as close to the end user as the ISP can, because again, they own the collection, connection all the way to your house, that last mile. So they can offer some serious quality advantages as well as cost advantages over the existing incumbents in the CDN space. And uh, these factors, you know, the fact that they're caught in this existential cost revenue squeeze, that they have some cost advantages, they have some quality advantages, are really going to drive a lot of these network service providers to running their own CDNs, whether it's a transparent cash type invisible CDN, or whether it's a commercial CDN, or whether it's just an internal CDN to support their own IPTV services, or if they're MSO TV Everywhere services, these are all ways to drive new revenue as well as controlling costs. And that's why we're really excited to be uh, providing our software and services to companies who are doing exactly that. It's a very competitive and price sensitive market, Larry. And while people are willing to pay $10 a month for Hulu Plus or Netflix, I don't think they're going to pay a lot more. So trying to get the consumers to absorb these additional costs that are rooted in the network, just not going to happen. And Comcast is obviously trying to push costs off in the other direction, back toward the content owner. But the fact is that eventually that stuff is going to circle back and have to be passed on to the consumer. And again, it won't play. Because we saw first in the music business and now in the video business that if you make it convenient and inexpensive for consumers, to buy content, they will pay for it. It doesn't have to be free. But if it's too expensive or not convenient enough, they do have backdoor alternatives that we don't like to talk about. But you know, it's the uh, elephant in the room that we'll all avoid mentioning. But it's just always over your shoulder when you're thinking about raising prices. So the real solution is things that just take costs out of the system by clever applications of technology like transparent proxy, reverse proxy, replacing network bandwidth with caching servers. And if doing that also happens to get you higher quality, which means you may actually be able to charge a little more, because instead of offering lower quality than what they used to get from cable TV, you're offering equivalent quality, so you don't have to give them as much of a revenue discount, all the better. The whole tsunami-like pace of growth of video on the internet is such that you're not going to have a real long time lag between the leaders and the followers. So my guess would be maybe it won't be till 2012 that you really see the tornado of network operators starting to do some of this stuff. But it's definitely going to grow very strongly in 2011. And you'll see that a lot of the leading lights in the space have already announced initiatives in this uh, arena. And you know, the uh, next waves are going to follow probably a slightly bigger wave in 2011 and a real big one in 2012.